looking for the God story and news of the day. My Michelle Live News and Views. Here's Michelle. Here's Michelle and my guest today, Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein, who gives us a bit of a view from now Jerusalem. A view from Jerusalem with Rabbi Adlerstein. And today, there are some things, well, let's say that people have gotten a bit fanatical about. We're going to take that on and how it is your children. Rabbi, good to connect with you. Welcome. Thanks so much. And the weather is perfectly appropriate for this. We had great weather, unfortunately, almost no rain. And now we're getting plenty of rain. So when I look out of my window... Everything is cloudy, which is the way a lot of the world looks. And the storm clouds are, are getting thicker and thicker. And here when, tonight, I think we're not going to prognosticate about how much worse things are going to get, but to talk about actual damage that the current state of the world and lack of spirituality in the world is having on society. I like that you get to the point right away and then we can parse through what that means in real life and some of the news stories, but it really is a matter of what's your worldview and gosh, how's that working for you? And I wanted to start off right off the bat with a lot of news stories and this is affecting particularly on the coastal cities and the blue states, it's strangely, it's a phenomenon among our youth, and it has to do with what they identify as. Now, they say that Gen Z is more than twice as likely to identify as LGBTQ than any other generation. In some schools, they're doing polls, and 20 to 30 percent of kids identify as LGBTQ. We are now in a place where children can get gender reassignment surgery. Pfizer, for example, is putting out testosterone. You can go to Planned Parenthood and get hormone blockers, oftentimes in many states without parental approval or help or knowledge or without any kind of counseling or a note from a counselor. We're literally, in my opinion, and then we'll see how you have, you weigh in this with a view from Jerusalem. It's as though we're performing genital mutilation on children before they really have an idea of the impact of their decision. And it has become, I would say, like a social contagion. What is going on? What are your thoughts? Let's take it on. It's a painful one because there's a lot of pain being visited on a lot of people. To start with, just as you say, the idea that in some school districts, schools are not allowed to tell parents about what their kids are expressing. So they can't really be parents to their kids. But the big ones here are that I think that there are two parts to this phenomenon. There is the, the part in which new ideas, whether they're healthy or not, are contagious. And if enough people push them, if that's where the prevailing culture is, is this cachet attached to announcing that, I'm not sure which closet I came out of, but I'm coming out of a closet. So now I'm part of a privileged minority. A privilege become underprivileged or whatever, it's pretty confusing. And that leads many, that leads, it's one factor that has to be considered as to why so many people. I heard about one campus that went beyond your 20 to 30 percent and claimed that 40 percent of their students were identifying as LGBT. Now, nobody believes, nobody in the behavioral sciences believe that all of those people are really experiencing a different kind of sexuality. But there's so much confusion around and with a pressure out there that, hey, maybe I am, and it gets me some attention. So that's part of it. The other part, which is perhaps more dangerous, is that some of this is probably real. We know, and we've known this for decades, that real gender identity is not the same thing 
as biology. A biology does determine at birth whether you have X chromosomes or XY chromosomes, and for the vast majority of mankind, those are the two, those are the two options, with some exceptions here or there, but nothing what's currently invoked. But we also know that identity is something that, that people have to work out for themselves. And teen years are years in which people decide what they are. Are they straight? Are they gay? And the circumstances, the environment, the culture has a good part of that. We've known for a long time that kids will experiment and it's no great cause for fear by their parents because they used to at least get it right in the end. But today, when you allow for things as options, people don't like so many options. We don't do so well with so many options. And when you have impressionable teens now told that it's not one of two options that they have, but over 40 that they have to choose from. I don't know, I have these feelings sometimes and I'm attracted. And the very idea of offering the choices, the fact that we legalized gay marriage and put it on par with cisgender marriage, and not so long ago, but it's been a couple of decades already by now, means that they're kids who are going to be genuinely confused, general, genuinely confused used and have trouble making the kind of choices that people like you and me could make Indeed. more decades ago. The, and part of the problem is the censoring of any kind of debate on this issue. We can start with gay marriage, for example. You and I have, have talked about this to a degree that we hold a biblical view of marriage as be sacred between a man and a woman. Those who are outside of the biblical view, if they're making un if they're in union with one another, if they what whatever they're doing, if society recognizes that for whatever reasons, legal reasons or you can visit someone in the hospital reasons or whatever it may be, we can look at that and recognize, okay, that's what that is, but you said we must put it on par with. Now, in, in my faith, we have this thing called communion. Bread, wine, sign of the cross, whatever they do and whatever church you go to. And I've often said, look, if society says, hey, we want communion too, but we're going to make it pizza and root beer, we can say, okay, you do you. But this is what God has, in my faith, this is what God has ordained as communion. This is, you know, how the church sees it. You call it what you want, call it pizza night, but it's not biblical communion, right? Likewise, a marriage between a man and a woman is a biblical union. That's marriage. You want to do whatever you do. It's not on par. It's not quite the same. Let's start you know, there. One of the challenges for you and me, and I imagine most of the listeners to this program, is that invoking biblical authority should be the starting point, not the end point. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a wonderful thing for people to hold on and to say, okay. I have faith and I believe that this is the word of God, but the word of God, 95% of the time, if not more, makes sense. God doesn't throw things at us and say, I'm going to give you nonsense and test your faith to Just see. Just to see if you'll believe. Stick with me even through the nonsense. There, It's ultimately reasonable. And we have to discover the reasonableness of it. Now, it doesn't take too much insight. And this is, I'm telling you, one man's way of looking at it. There are others as well. But the big difference between the biblical view of marriage and what we have today in the way that you described. It's a relationship and it's giving this between consenting adults and it works. So why should it not be recognized on par? The difference is that it's not just that we're invoking the Bible. We're invoking the way the Bible looks at the relationship between men and women and the institution of marriage. To be brief and blunt, the biblical conception of marriage is that it's two people who are pledging to each other to create a safe environment for the children they will bring into the world. And we got tons and tons of data to suggest that there is nothing out there that compares as favorably in a potential for success as growing up 
in a loving family of two parents. Marriage used to mean that we're going to stick with each other in thin, thick and thin and in, in good health and bad health and everything in between because we're out to pursue a higher good than our own satisfaction and our own pleasure. The new definition of marriage has replaced that with saying that marriage is something that works for me. I feel like a more complete person. I found another side of myself. I'm happy with the relationship. The relationship can be mutual. It's serving both of us, but that just means intensifying both of our egos rather than taking bits of that ego and mutually pledging to use it to create something new and something more and continuity and more servants of God and a platform for God's word on this earth. So it's not just the idea that we're sticking with the old time religion, but that sense and sensibility are on our side. And it's so troubling. It hurts so much for us to have to look at people if by the millions who are dooming themselves to, to, to lives that could have been, that are not what they could be, and creating environments for children that are, that are bound to, to be problematic for, for them and for mankind. And as we see what's happening to our children, this explosion of I don't know who I am or what I am, I have a problem with that on a couple of levels, but two in particular. One, not being grateful for the fearfully, wonderfully made person that you are. I'm not good enough. And we tell you, your kids, believe in yourself. You're good enough. You should celebrate who you are. Although, if you really want to be who you are, you're going to have to look like something else. You're going to have to get surgery. You're going to, what message is that really sending? And that leads to the second one, Rabbi, is that we've seen with the race issues that, that there's this dissatisfaction and we have reason to be against each other. They say sex is a social construct, but in reality, race is the social construct. It's, it and your sexual identity. It's just something that we socially construct. What is a man? What is a woman? The biology of it is settled. It can come in a beautiful array. I tend to be more of an outdoorsy. I don't have long fingernails kind of a girl. I'm just a little, I've always been a tomboy. Boy, if I was growing up right now, I, I'm sure they'd have me in the office trying to shove transitioning medication down my throat. I can celebrate being a woman in the way that God's created me, this uniqueness. But the social constructs of race, because we're all human, and all of these myriads of alphabet identities are all weird social constructs that get us away from the true identity that we were created in and the purpose we were created for. Let's take that on, because that is controversial. But I think it's key. It's beyond controversial. I don't know no, please enlighten me if I'm making a mistake here, but we're seeing the growth of this wave of antipathy to religion, mm -hmm. not religion or my religion, any religion that does two things, that has firm, uncompromising values, and that dares to attribute them to God. That is unthinkable today. It used to be that outlier groups said, you guys are, you're Christianizing America and you're not leaving any room for us. All we want is some recognition. We want to feel that we're important as well. But it's gone 180 degrees different away from that. It's that you guys are now the threat to us. Because if you believe that there are givens, if you believe that nature is not infinitely malleable, then there may be some moral values as well. Let me give you an example, Rabbi. This is a real news story that just came out this week. There was a queer Disney star, and he had to come out and assure concerned fans 
that he's okay because he suddenly turned to Christianity. Wait, so I'm Michelle, okay, tell me and this they're, is they're from, worried, they're concerned. What? Tell me this is a parody that you, in the beacon, or is this real? Yes, this is a real news story, Rabbi. A queer Disney star here has uh, had to come out, Joshua Bassett. There, his fans were concerned because he has come out as a Christian. So there's reason to be concerned. Now, there's no reason to be concerned if a five-year-old little girl go, is counseled by her teacher that you should be a man, and they start, you know, down the road to blocking puberty before she even knows what a man or a woman really is. No concern there. We don't even have to notify teachers. But, boy, this star who was queer comes out as a Christian, and now we have reason to be worried. What? As an aside, I think I've mentioned before that most people, both Americans and Israelis, have no idea how much our two societies have in common. We find ourselves here in this battle internally because a, a, a government that is further to the right than the last one has come into power. And now people are saying, the world is coming to an democracy end. Democracy is it. It's really a <laughs> democracy, and that's it. That's the end of Israel and the great dream. Because now people who actually believe in religion and in nationalism and take pride in being Israeli and building up this great country after 2,000 years of Jewish exile, they are the threat. They Forget Iran. Forget about Hezbollah. The real problem are the religious there are too many of them, and they're taking over the country. And I'm not exaggerating a bit. It's exactly the same thing as what's going on in the United States. Because we're in the middle of this incredible Kulturkampf, this war within between two different conceptions of, of what culture should be like. And you just solved a problem, as you know, for the people who are serious students of the Bible. In Genesis 1, I think, 1 or 2, you find this refrain that God created ex limineu, uh, according to their kind. The phrase, according to their kind, according to their kind, keeps on getting repeated in one of the opening chapters of Genesis. And most of us say, yeah, that's the way the Bible speaks. That's good old King biblical language. But it means something. And one of my, my, my great sort of mentors, although it was 150 years ago, said that the Bible emphasizes according to their kind in order for you to understand that God created things with discernible boundaries between different species, different areas of life, that there are things that are given that despite this wonderful gift of the intellect and God's challenge, go out there and conquer the world. But there got to be some boundaries because God designed the world that some things <sighs> just so. There's not a lot of boundaries, and that's really what our society is about. And that worldview that we talked about is the tearing down boundaries. There are no boundaries. Pushing against the boundaries, actual rebellion. And I think a lot of that as we talk about the pushback against religion or traditional ideas, and specifically with the uprising of 20 to 30 percent of our kids don't know what gender they are my gosh it wasn't bad enough in schools that they can't read write and do simple math now they can't handle basic biology either but the troubling thing is this exactly what you're saying we have no boundaries and so these kids who when you think about the children who are at uh, at risk of this are the same kids that were experiencing bulimia, anorexia, cutting, and a, a dissatisfaction with who they are. Now we give them new thing to be able to get involved in. And if you can identify as something other than what you were born as, then you get this recognition and affirmation and suddenly you can have a fast track to popularity and acceptance and victimhood. These comorbidities are completely ignored and so is some of the press. There was a story that you may be aware about, aware of, Kira Bell. 
If you haven't heard the story of Kira Bell, it is likely because you live in a society where they really like to downplay some of the the news stories that don't go along with the narrative. And Rabbi, for the interest of our listeners, Bell is a girl who is a transgender. She went, she sued a nas- the National Gender Clinic in the UK because she said she didn't have counseling. She was just transitioned thing she had breast augmentation things cut off and so she sued and she won and the court was outraged that there were no protocols in fact these protocols that that she went through that don't exist is the same kind of thing that happens in the u.s there was no psychological counseling there was nothing it was completely ignored and now as a result there are more protections in place in the uk but not so much in places like the united states there in the united states we know that when abigail schreier wrote that terrific book, just bringing the American public awareness of what's going on, there there was this massive campaign to shut her down. And most of it's successful, removing the book from sales, from different venues, and removing it from libraries, where all that she really did was to say, hey, what's going on here? We're taking innocent kids, not even teenagers and transforming them for life in a way that's irreversible. And I gotta add, Michelle, you focused a couple of minutes ago on the fact that teenagers are often troubled and it expresses itself in different ways. And when they're really troubled, we have things in the past like bulimia and anorexia and cutting. The difference is that back then, when people were educated about it, so they tried helping people not starve themselves and not cut themselves but this is the first time where this this acting out is encouraged by society and will pay for it energy come on jump down the rabbit hole so you're saying with that same logic if a girl's cutting herself will you identify as as a cutter bulimic will you identify as a fat as a skinny person even that you you, we would just affirm that problem instead of help that problem now i know that as you mentioned uh, a, a very small percent of us are not born right there's things that are off the xx the xy whatever it may be or sometimes off our mental capacity may be off we should be there to help people and support people and honestly as an adult whatever road you go down full disclosure one of my best friends is a male that has had breast augmentation and a brilliant and beautiful person and very precious to me and but it's a struggle it isn't just a oh yay woohoo everything's great tom made decisions as an adult not as a child and most people who struggle with that mindset legitimately are the very ones who are also speaking out against this travesty towards children. We're just going down a path that is without boundaries and so pushing back against biblical values. How do we pull ourselves out of this? You don't make it easy. I wish I had a magic magic pill. The the only thing that, that I can advise is that for the still hundreds of millions of Americans, although unfortunately the declining number that sense, intuit, believe with, if not every fiber of their being with most of them, that there is a God, that God speaks to man, that the Bible is the way in which God communicated reliably to man. We've got to find better ways of emphasizing that first to ourselves and then to our families, to bind to one another in community and in communion, to use your word, with people who are like-minded, who can support each other. And we have to, to a certain extent, create our own subculture, one which is affirming of our values, proud of itself, let it take a cue from gay pride, e- even if we don't, we're not totally on board with the idea, but 
the idea that a community needs to take pride in itself. You know, pride. So we can have the pride of believers. And it's easier for me to say, because I am an Orthodox Jew, and this is the way we've been surviving for about 2,000 years. <laughs> yes. and, and Christianity now is a minority in America. And even in right-wing evangelical circles, the kids are dropping, dropping like flies. But that still leaves a heck of a lot of us who are not going to give up. It first starts, Michelle, with people understanding why it is that they believe. Not just saying, well, I believe and my parents believe. That's great. It's a gift from God. It's a good starting point. But figure out why it is that this belief that you have makes sense and is the best thing for you Thank and for you. With that, at least we have a fighting chance. It may mean, as I've said many times before, that you may have to start considering what Jews did for 2,000 years, maintaining, usually we were forced to, a certain amount of isolation, maybe self-imposed partial cultural isolation. There's no reason why Christians can't have their own subculture. It's easier today than it ever was with social media, but to use them positively to create virtual communities and real communities where people are really proud of these values, not just because I believe and you believe and that's great. So now we're brothers. Understand why you believe. Read people like, oh, I'm missing the name now. It'll come to me. At Princeton, the great Catholic right-wing thinker. Oh boy, I hope now he's the not- the name listening. escapes me as well. He's going he's gonna to kill me. There, there are a whole bunch of really astute thinkers coming out of conservative Christian schools and groups that help you understand why these things make sense and why we're not just saying, oh, I'm going to stand with the old time religion because I'm a traditionalist. But isn't that the beauty of when the heat gets turned up and when your children fall away and people stop going to church? The beauty of that is, is that's the time where you become less complacent, where you check your worldview, where you say, is Maybe they're right. Let's look into it. What, why do I believe what I believe? And once you exactly. realize that there's a power in a biblical worldview, it becomes imperative that you stand there. And you can speak the truth, but also speak it in love, with deference, with care. It's not an us against them. It's not you are the great evil, because that's a lot of what's happened in our society. It's about loving and understanding people, meeting them where they're at, but staying true to what is true, what is right, what is good, what is lovely, what is of, of good report, if it's praiseworthy, sticking to the things that really are eternal can give eternal hope in this crazy, mixed up, lost world and hope for parents. As a side note with the LGBTQ issue, the vast majority of parents who are feeling disenfranchised are not the conservative parents. It's not happening to them as quickly as it's Mark. happening to more left-leaning parents who say, I, I support the whole agenda. I just don't think that, I think my daughter or son is just jumping into this. But now they're experiencing that disenfranchisement and being canceled by society. And that's where maybe our strength and our resolve can be a little hope in, as they're looking for answers. I'll give you Let me pick up words. on what you just said as just a small step that contributes to it. But you talked about the way in which we should do this and with reasonableness, politeness, with refined argumentation rather than, rather than cancel society and what it does. To, as a riff on the old adage, you catch a lot more flies with honey than with a <laughs> water. And we live in a society where it's all fly swatting. Just the wow. way in book in which we can show that we do value, we do listen, and we do take into account what others, and we speak not with angry, shrill rhetoric of that's popular, even in our circles, even in our circles, oftentimes. But to speak in a way that gets people to say, there's something about this person, about these people and the way they speak, which seems to be more godly than what's happening on the other side. That would be a welcome contribution. 
I do not know what more I could add to that. That is just the message of hope that we talk about. That's the God story that we like to get to on this program. And what I love best is that this is a tough, heart-wrenching, disturbing, even scary, and oh my gosh, what's going on in our society topic. And yet here we are at the end of it today with hope. That's what God does. That's what my God does. Woo. I so appreciate you, our audience, and me at the charge. Love you dearly, Rabbi. Thank you so much for being thank with you. us today. God bless Thanks you. Thanks for the opportunity. And thank you for watching, listening, and being part of the fun. You can find us at MyMichelleLive.com. More news and views at MyMichelleLive.com.